ones, but at any particular point, there's a finite number of them that include the point in their domain. And um, the support that's... The non-zero part of the function. Right, right. And also the sum, which is the sum over alpha of phi alpha of p is equal to 1 alpha in the index bit at each point in the manifold. So wherever sum has, at, at each point, there's only finitely many things in the sum, although there can be infinitely many functions in the partition, mm -hmm. just not all at the same point. They're arranged such that, you know, they have finitely many of them at a given point. And this is called a partition of unity. Theorem 1.72, let M be a normal smooth manifold u, a locally finite cover of m. If each u alpha has compact closure, then there is a partition of unity subordinate to that to that uh, locally finite cover. So it's not a particularly uh, restrictive condition that there be a partition of unity, like lots of manifolds have partitions of unity. Basically what you need to set up a theory of integration, but um, hmm. over the manifold. So when you study integration of a manifold properly, you'll you'll do a lot with partitions of unity, um, which tells you something about my treatment of integration on a manifold. <laughs> I was just trying to get you guys some sense of intuition there, not you know. All right. Um, okay. So partition of unity. The point is, you can use those to build formulas, which is pretty awesome. In particular, here. What he does is the following. Um, he lets zeta. Well, is that zeta or is that c? I don't know. It's the this thing. It's like a three with a tail. Where'd it go? The uh, c. C. Yeah, I think it's like a c. <laughs> Which, as you know, I have, it's one of my canonical weaknesses, being able to say that. All right, anyway, so, um, <laughs> minus, uh, what the, what does that mean? Ah, uh, there's more notation here i got to explain. Rho sub v, eta, and then there's an upper u on this for some reason. <laughs> Rho sub u of eta. There's an upper v on this for some reason. He says, I'll, I'll explain it, where rho sub v eta of u is the um, extension is the extension of the form rho v of eta um, It's the extension of rho v restricted to u intersect v of eta to um, to u by zero. So this could find everywhere else where it's not finding zero. Oh, yes. So first of all, the um, the function rho sub v is a mapping from from v to the inter real interval 0 to 1. Um, so certainly the intersection of u and v is in there. It could be empty, I suppose, but uh, I think we're assuming otherwise to make it interesting at the moment. But um, All right. Uh, and the uh, definition of the other one is comparable, right? So you take rho of u intersect v of eta and then extend it to v by zero. All right. He says this may look backwards at first, so note carefully that we use rho sub v, which has support in v, to get a function on u. 
Hmm. And similarly, Rho sub U is used to define pun V on V. Mm-hmm. Um, figure 10.1 shows the circle as a union of two open sets and it's a schematic of what we have in mind. Let me put down figure 10.1 for us to... That might help a little bit, guide our thinking. Where's my 10.1 in here? Yeah. What? Weird. What? Dude! Must be on the next page. Uh huh. Uh, there we go. Alright. So here's the circle. It's got five circles. Um. Alright, I'm gonna attempt. I'm gonna try. I'm trying. I'm trying, guys. So eta equals to zero here. Eta equals to one here. This is u. This is v. So got some like little tail. He's got a, his picture has got like a little in this one he's got a little thing coming out of here like this and then he's written minus rho sub v eta and here he's got a little tail coming off this way and he's written written wrote and wrote and listen to me rho sub u of eta And then here he's got like a little like like that and he's got a minus D of rho V eta. And down here like a little bump and then D of rho U eta. And he still has the picture of U and the um, kind of shaded, like this is picturing the set U and picturing the set V like that. Okay, so eight is one on that bit, and eight is zero on that bit. So he says, eta in omega zero is one. So eta is a cup function, all right? It's one on the connected component of u intersect v, and zero on the other component. So it's this eta is zero one place and one the other. Um, I think he's defining eta to be that, right? Eta, where did eta? Well, why? <laughs> what? Pick eta, if eta is an element of that. You can just make eta be zero or one. Oh, I guess that's an example. Suppose eta was a zero form. Mm. Alright, suppose eta was a zero form and it was one <coughs> there and it was zero there. 
then this is how the construction would play out. So the, the picture is an example of the idea. It's not, I mean, eta is still, this eta is still arbitrary. That's a robust general formula for whatever it is we're doing at the moment for C. He says, perhaps the notation is too pedantic. If we let the restrictions and extensions by zero take care of themselves, so to speak, the idea is expressed by saying that the partial I star map maps the element minus, basically drop the U and the V there um, to the direct sum of forms on U, direct sum forms on V, to the difference of the difference, which is just eta again, on the intersection. Thus we see that partial I star is surjective. So basically the next step is he takes partial I, partial I star of this thing, and he shows that it maps back to eta. How does that work? How does partial I star do? It takes I2 star, right? Pull back under I2 of the what? Of the second component, which in this case is rho u eta, right? Extend to v by zero. Minus I1 star, right? Pull back. Of course, I could use the... I should probably just go ahead and use the... Um, this insight, right? Since I'm running out of places, I mean, I can just jump to mm -hmm. that is, after all, what these are doing, so let's just get to it, right? So, really, we're just taking rho, u, eta, extend, so you take that thing and restrict it to u intersect v, and subtract from it rho v, well, <laughs> there's a minus here, right? <coughs> That's very sneaky, because that minus gives you a plus, <coughs> right? And, oh, this is, this is very, very clever. Look at this. What is this? Think about a particular point, right? Like, Well, I guess we only should think about points in the intersection, right? Think about a point in the intersection. If we're thinking about a point in the intersection, this is just rho u, eta, plus rho v, eta, right? Good. How would they Right, and by definition of the partition of unity, that's just... I mean, these are, these are scalar multiples times a form. So it could be like a half times a three form plus another half times a different three, times the same three form. It gives you a three form. I mean, the eta could be a differential 300 form. Who knows? I mean, whatever. Not that I want to write that. A lot of wedges. So what exactly did we show here? We have shown that the I star map is surjective. Because uh. we picked anything in the forms of the intersection of U and V, and we show that there is a pair of one form, a pair of forms rather, in U, the forms over U and the forms over V, in particular this and that, uh, that when mapped under I star, we get back to eta. So that shows that that is a search action. Mm -hmm. And then, <laughs> goodness gracious, so then there's another paragraph, but he says it's easy to show that the compo composite of 
a partial I star with J1 star comma J3 star is equal to zero, so that the image of the J star map is a subset of the kernel of the I star map. Mm -hmm. And uh, da, 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 da. It's five o'clock p.m. Uh oh, well my time is with. I mean, let me try to get to the the end game here. Anyway, the point is that's a good chunk of the proof that that's a short exact sequence, mm -hmm. but. I mean, I, this gives you a flavor for it. I mean, the arguments are much as you've already seen, just with the differential, like your derivative, as opposed to, you know, your other map. In fact, the main technical result in this chapter I've already proved for you guys in advanced calculus. Probably the most interesting construction in this whole chapter is Pomkrate's lemma. And the proof is pretty much what I showed you. So that's, that's kind of cool. We can skip that. <laughs> but um, let me just tell you the theorem here. Let's try to collect some major results. And then we'll call it a, call it a semester, I suppose. Let's see here. So um, this is interesting. Theorem 10.8. Says this. Um, so he defines map. He defines um, if you take the Cartesian product of the manifold with the reals, you can of course define the projection map, right? And also a section S sub A. So like um, S sub A of X is equal to x comma a, right? And um, this then uh, gives rise to um, corresponding maps on the the cohomology, right? Contravariant, right? And moreover, we have that um, pi star, which again is a mapping from the homology on M, cohomology rather, to the cohomology on M Cartesian product of the reals. And S sub A star, which is a mapping from where? From, um, well, the cohomology of the Cartesian product of M with the reals, to the cohomology of M. All right, these maps, guess what? These are mutual inverses. In particular, we have that the cohomology of a manifold across the reals is isomorphic to the homology of the manifold. Cohomology, I keep saying homology, but I should say cohomology. I have no idea what happens with homology, actually. Although I guess you could figure it out. But the proof of this is beautiful and about two pages long, and it is, well, I'll show you guys, it involves that K-map that we looked at for the proof of the Poincaré lemma, remember? The K-map involves integrating forms over the cylinder, one of the cylinder coordinates you integrate away. Look at these formulas, they should be vaguely reminiscent to you from advanced calculus. Like differential composed with K minus K composed with the differential is like the I think I had like J0 and J1 in my mappings in the advanced calculus. Mm. But if you sort through this, you'll, it'll be very, it's, I, I'm pretty sure it's the same argument that we went through in advance with different notation. I'm not 100% sure I haven't worked through it, but anyway, it's about two pages, this proof. It involves two cases, the, the forms with or without the DT. Remember, remember that? <laughs> yeah, just like... That is absolutely one of my favorite things we do in advanced calculus. I didn't realize it was the technical linchpin of the cohomology chapter in this book. I just I didn't realize that's what we're doing, but that is what we're doing. When you prove Poincaré's lemma, you're doing cohomology. 
truth be told. And that leads us to a corollary, which is pretty awesome. Poincaré lemma. What's the Poincaré lemma? It says that the kth homology of Rn is equal to the kth homology of a point. In other words, as we worked out a little bit earlier today, it's reals if k is equal to zero, and it's zero otherwise. You can probably almost see the proof in your mind already, right? Like, the Patati proof, that, I mean, how's it, why is, how's the corollary proof go? Of course, if you take hk <laughs> of rn, that's hk of what? R, R cross R n minus 1. Exactly. Which, of course, is R n minus 1, all right? Which is R n minus 2, all right? And so forth and so on until eventually you get to h k of R, right? And then, well, all the way down, right? <laughs> That was very cool, I thought. But, and then the homotopy axiom. If f goes from m to n and g goes to m to, uh, m to n are homotopic, then the induced maps um, from the cohomology of n to the cohomology of m, and likewise for g star, are equal. Goodness. Is that obvious? What does that have to do with this? Do you guys see it? So here we have f going from m to n, g going from m to n, homotopic. Is that right? He says the induced maps are equal. Proof. He says, by extending homotopy as in exercise 1.77, we may assume that we have a map F. Oh! Sneaky, sneaky stuff. So usually we define homotopy, right? From M cross a unit interval. There exists, you can extend it though, you can instead write homotopy from like M cross the reals. The relevance here. So we have. So you can you can you can reformulate homotopy as this point by exercise one point seventy seven. Like this, right? And in particular, <laughs> there's 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 a, of course a, there's a, a type one book at this point, but um, f of x comma t, and misprint really I shouldn't say typo. Is f of x for t greater than or equal to one, and um, this is the this is the exercise 177 stuff. Uh, f of x comma t is equal to g of x for what? Zero. Yeah, t less than or equal to zero. That 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 makes sense, right? So like, standard homotopy makes it match up f of x at zero and match up g of x at 1, and this is just saying just, just keep it like that afterwards, right? It's just... So then... So then what do we do? He says, if S1 of x is equal to x comma 1, all right, and S0 of x 
is equal to x comma 0, then you can see that little f is equal to big F composed with S1, and little g is equal to big F composed with S0. Do you guys agree? Yeah, that's pretty intuitive. Or, I mean, you just evaluate it, so. Right, right. So then, <laughs> look at this. So F, F star is equal to S1 star composed with F star, right? And G star is S not star composed with F star, right? And he says it's easy to check that S1 star and S not star are one-sided inverses of pi star, where m from uh, from m cross where pi from is the projection from m across r to m as before. But we have shown that pi star is an isomorphism, and it follows that S1 star is equal to S not star in cohomology. And then from above we have that F star is equal to G star. So basically, what he's saying is that. Um, um, you know, up to boundary, up to boundary terms, S1 star is equal to S0 star, so that implies that F, F star is equal to G star. More or less. So there you go, homotopic, um, so if two maps are homotopic, then they they induce the same uh, chain map, right? right yeah. Homotopy invariants, if M and M are smooth manifolds of the same homotopy type, then they have the same cohomology. So homotopic map, so homotopic manifolds have, have the same hom cohomology. So corollary, if M is a contractible N manifold, then it's zero cohomology is the reals, and otherwise it's zero. see here. Then the next, um, you know, there's two kinds of cohomology people look at. The one is the one we're looking at right now, which is just by differential forms that, you know, are on the, on the whole manifold, right? The other kind of cohomology people look at is what's called compact, compactly supported cohomology, all right? And um, so that's, it's different. Um, they're related but different, and um, so if your manifold's compact, they're not different. Okay, for one thing. But if the manifold isn't compact, then there there can be a difference. And um, so here's the definition. What is what does it mean to say um, compactly supported differential forms? Differential forms where the support of the uh, functions are compact? Right, or at least they're contained in a compact set. There may be a little bit of hands-offness, but it's close to that. Mm -hmm. I mean, to be a little bit coarse, the differential forms are only non-zero inside some sort of compact space, which means that you can integrate them mm -hmm. in a natural way. Um, anyway, uh, so this is a little bit slippery. There's some kind of sneaky stuff that goes on here. Pretty cool, pretty neat, explicit argument I'm about to show you. Um, so what's the definition? Well, here's the definition. The definition is a little bit sneaky. So the compact, the homology, the cohomology with compact support, H K H sub C upper K of M. It's equal to the compact cycles, K cycles, mod the compact uh, boundaries, but that's not quite the right thing to be more specific. Well, I mean, the first thing is what you think it is. Um, here, Z sub C K of M is um, vector space of closed K forms.
vector space and closed K forms with compact support. All right. But the B sub C K of M, a little bit different, is all forms D omega where omega has compact support. He says, note carefully that B sub C K of M is not the set of exact K forms with compact support. It's the set of things that came from <laughs> yeah, things that are compact support. derivatives of such things, yeah. Um, to, sh to show you the difference, he has this example, which is pretty cool. So he says, let f be a smooth function on our end, right? And you can consider omega, which is f dx1 wedge, da da da, wedge dxn, right? And then he says, this is exact, since every closed form on our end is exact. Right, so d omega is zero. That's automatic, it's an n form. But Funkray's lemma basically says that, well, that's um, exact. Right? Um, where was I? Oh, and, and this, he says consider f with compact support and with he wants f greater than zero and f greater what <laughs> he rewrites this with compact support all right but here's the here's the thing that blows my mind and <laughs> yes in my in my version f greater than zero and f greater than zero <laughs> uh, at some point now, um, I believe he's saying it's somewhere positive and somewhere negative. Otherwise, it's not an interesting sentence, right? He says, it's ex all right, so this is exact because every closed form on Rn is exact. However, omega cannot be d alpha for some alpha with compact support. Why is that? He says, if it was the case, you could do this. The integration over Rn of omega is equal to the integral over Rn of d alpha, which is equal to the integral over the boundary of Rn of alpha, which is, by the way, zero. which contradicts the assumption that f is non-negative. Okay, I take it back. That's what it was. f is non-negative, but it's positive somewhere. Then, if that's the case, certainly the integral of omega is non-zero, because if it's like a little bit, if it's positive some neighborhood, it has to be that this is not equal to zero, right? integrate something that's somewhere positive, you have to get a non-zero thing. Because it can't just be positive at one point, because f is continuous. Mm. So it's got to be positive in some neighborhood and non-zero integral. But on the flip side, the boundary of Rn is what? Exactly. <laughs> so it's zero. There's no boundary. Um, which contradicts our assumption that f is non-negative. And, by the way, this already shows that the nth cohomology of Rn is non-zero. Using a bump function with support inside a chart, you can similarly show that the, n, the nth cohomology group over a manifold is non-zero um, with compact support. The ones with those ones. Anyway, it's very beautiful. Um, you know, it's used these really pretty arguments that built, built things with uh, the compact support arguments. And, there's a Mayer-Viatoris sequence for cohomology with compact supports. 
Um, there's an analog of Poincaré's lemma again. Um, and um, ultimately for the, let's see here, the compactly supported cohomology, we get this. You guys tell me, is this different? HCN of Rn is equal to um, R or 0. What was it before? It was R. Are you saying HCK? Yes, I should. Sorry, the way he had it written is messing with me. So for k, k equal to what? Zero. Right, before it was zero, now it's n. Hmm. So as you can see, the compactly supported cohomology and the non-compactly co supported cohomology are different. For example, this. Um, but there is... Um, there is an isomorphism in this case. You get this following theorem for these guys. This is a pretty neat theorem. It says um, you get this isomorphism and it's mutual inverse. I won't define these maps, but just to give you a sense of their existence. The compactly supported K cohomology of the manifold across the reals and the K minus one cohomology, compactly supported cohomology of M, and vice versa. How is that different than the theorem we had a second ago? Uh, the one didn't have, like, it wasn't K minus one. Right, it was just linked to the same level. This links different <coughs> levels of the cohomology. That's kind of neat, right? So That theorem takes the thing I just wrote down as a corollary, and you can probably see the proof of it if you think about it. So then next we talk about the um, Poincaré duality, right, which um, basically relates the k cohomology to the n minus k cohomology for a n-dimensional manifold. We saw some some amount of that in the advanced calculus course. It's pretty it's pretty nicely stated in Rentlin from what I remember, but he has he has some of the proofs of those things in here. In fact, this book has the musical morphisms and other things done pretty nicely. As you know, this is where I, I went to when I was not happy with the level of detail in Rentlin. Um, but yeah, that's basically Poincaré duality. If M is an oriented N-manifold with a finite good cover, yeah, whatever that is, <laughs> then for each K, the map PDK from the kth cohomology of M to the dual of the n minus kth cohomology of M is an isomorphism. And the proof here is about a paragraph or so. It's, cool. it's an induction proof, and it's not that hard to understand if you build up the other stuff in here. But um, corollary: if M is a connected oriented n manifold with a finite good cover, then the nth cohomology, the compactly supported cohomology of M, is the reals. And this isomorphism is given by integration over M. He then defines the degree map of a function. Um, oh, and the other thing I haven't talked about is the, the need to look at proper maps. You have to get proper proper maps. You, you can't just, like for the regular cohomology, the, we didn't have any kind of compact support to, to fool around with. So you take the pullback of an n-form, you get an n-form, right? If it's a continuous function, it's good to go. But when you're dealing with a compactly supported cohomology, you have to do the pullback with a function that respects that compact supporting. Mm -hmm. So you have to take what's called a proper map. A proper map, proper map takes the inverse 
inverse image of a compact set is compact once more. So you have to, the, um, the chain map stuff has to be done with proper maps. So there is some more fine print, but they're, it's, it's interesting how different they are, really, the compactly supported cohomology versus the, the, the sort of raw cohomology here. Anyway, all of this, of course, is Durham cohomology. There is a larger word, world of cohomology, some of which you get to work on in your project, right? I mean, there's these universal coefficients theorems, there's the Kuhneth formula, all this good stuff, which I have lectured zero on, I'm sorry, but uh, now, um, oh, I'll try to send you. Have you done the Van Kampen problem yet with RP2? No. No? You have not? No. Good. I just found the section in my notes, which is very, very helpful. Very helpful. I will send you that as well. I, I just scanned it for Daniel because he was like, what the what? Like, he was trying to use Rotman to do it. I was like, I'm no. <laughs> I'm not supposed to use the yeah, that's what I was trying to do this. this. Yeah, don't, no, Rotman will not help you there. Yeah, this is, Rotman will, this is literally everything else. Rotman, <laughs> oh, it's, you, you've done everything except for that problem. Yeah. <laughs> that sounds about right. I mean, <laughs> Well, Daniel's like, yeah, I was trying to calculate the simplicial complex or something. I'm like, oh my god. Yeah, that's what I was trying to do too. No, 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 no. What you do <coughs> is you you take like the little um, free group model of RP2, basically, in terms of the identified edges. That gives you like a homeomorphic um, version of RP2. That's just like a little square, and you can divide that up into two open sets and look at the intersection and apply the Van Kampen theorem and all that stuff. My notes have about 10-15 about pages on sort of ramping you up and like I have the the, um, the free group of the, um, I show the free group of the torus is Z cross Z in my notes. I don't show it. Dr. Lada of NC State, now retired I think, showed it. And I mean that's not in home, I, don't, I think it's in Hatcher, I think it's from Hatcher or it's from his own work, I don't know. Um, anyway, when you look at my notes and then you look at the problem, you'll, you'll make sense of it. It's like pretty not too bad. <sighs> and uh, yeah, and again, as I was advertising to you, Daniel, and I will advertise anybody who cares, this book, Algebraic Topology, A First Course by William Fulton, is as advertised a first course. What we've done this semester, for those who are not interested in category theory and es esoteric mumbo-jumbo, is a poor choice. I still think it's the right choice because Nathan is who Nathan is. Um, so I think Maratman is the right book for us. But um, this book is very nice. He starts with winding number and, you know, th specific things about vector fields. And um, it builds its way up geometrically to understand, like, what homology and cohomology are geometrically. It's very nice. If I was to do this again, with other students, I would most likely use this book. So, and of course, I have no defense because this was suggested to me by someone who knows better <laughs> at the start. And I just said, "Well, Bill used the other one, so I'm going to use what Bill used." But you know, I have no regrets. But you know, whatever. Thanks, guys.